All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I am very excited to introduce my guest, Wes, who is from Germany. He is a trauma survivor, and he is also just an amazing, strong individual that I've really met in, in my life. And um, he is just a wealth of knowledge walking around of wisdom and knowledge. So hopefully today we get to pick his brain <laughs> with this interview. And then, left <laughs> yes, and you're also a musician. And I've heard your work and it is quite amazing. You put some uh, recently some music to a, it was it a, like a penguin documentary. It was beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was just, it blew my mind away. Like thank you. music made the video for sure. But thank anyway, you. I appreciate that. yeah, I'm so I happy have to have you. Now. That, that, that really feels good. Great. Thank you. I really yeah, feel, absolutely. Yeah, you. And I appreciate um, that. Um, so you're an amazing, amazing artist in that respect. And uh, so, yeah, let's um, let's talk a little bit about uh, your background in, in terms of like, you know, I, I want you to feel comfortable, like where you want to start with um, this discussion and everything. But um, you've learned a lot about surviving from trauma. And maybe we could go into first talking about um, what are some ways uh, that you use daily just in your life to be able to manage symptoms and um, health conditions and all of that. Be comfortable. I first have to want to say thanks to you also. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here and get to talk and share a little bit of something what I found. And to answer your question right away, um, right now um, I'm under acute um, bombardment of stress again. So um, the methods that used to work very well in the past for me to, to get me stabilized and and like into some sort of fluid liquid equilibrium, mm -hmm. um, they have limited effect at the moment. But however, if they weren't, I probably have gone, forgive me, batshit crazy already. So they still do a lot of good. And these are in particular, I don't go to bed without uh, listening to nature sounds streamed from whatever Alexa, you know, whatever you have, your your phone, um, some meditation music, uh, not so much the con uh, the affirmations, uh, ideally without spoken words, just nature sounds, a little bit of music, soothing things. That's number one. Um, I do have to rely on a little bit of natural medication in order to bring my system down from hyper arousal. Breathing, of course, breathing techniques work uh, very well. I had a, a number of sessions uh, with Hollis, uh, what's it called, holotropic breathing, like it um, goes back to uh, Stanislav Graf. He invented it after LST was abolished, was uh, scheduled one. Um, he had it in clinical trials. And after that, he uh, manifested basically the same body response uh, through breathing techniques. It's basically mimicking the hyper arousal, the hyperventilation. And then coming into a phase of uh, deep rest, ideally with a sitter, with a medical person, with someone trained in that, or in a group, it can be done in a group. So these are some of the things that work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and just simple things like I have the birds playing outside. Sometimes I watch them and really focus on these things. Anything that's good, anything that makes you feel connected to your true, authentic, vibrant self any of that as much and as often as possible mm. does it answer your question yeah absolutely and i remember um you sent me a a little link of like how much you walked that one day in like a loop around your uh town and i was just amazed um yeah. you know um so um yeah, also sports, just physical sports physical activity mild physical activity. Yeah, yeah yeah exactly and then also yeah. i know that you are a big uh, fan of listening to NDE podcasts. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> since 2014, two two uh, uh, two such episodes a day at least, you know, on average. Yeah, yeah, it it really helps. Like, yeah, keep things in perspective on a day to day basis. Oh yeah, um, oh, yeah. yeah. And you've yeah. you've done what? Oh, over six thousand? Did you say? Well, if you do the math, and it would come out at that. 
maybe yeah. there was a day with a break or so, but it's been a couple of thousand since then. Yeah. 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 I really went, I mean, when I commit to something, I go in all the way, you know, there's, <laughs> no, there's no stopping. So that's <laughs> so, right. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you also had a bit of an NDA experience yourself. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't like the typical angels and, you know, just like clouds and all of that. It was a little bit of a void experience. Um, yeah. And so you've, um, been able to like listen to these other NDEs and kind of like gain a little bit more information um, right. and uh, with your trauma background with as much as you feel comfortable mm -hmm. um, can you go into a little bit about that experience absolutely okay. um, first of all um, I can totally talk about it with, without getting re-triggered now because um, I think I've processed whatever processing was possible so yes it was the typical or is it typical I don't know but there are not as many void type experiences but I'm now beginning to hear from more and more experiences that even the blissful ones are preceded by uh, a period where they go into this it feels and and I would say feels because you don't have any visual reference or any reference at all it's like all of a sudden you're annihilated, but consciously witnessing it at the same time, which is kind of a paradox. I understand that, but that's the closest or the shortest that I could describe it as. So this happened at the age of four years old. I was only four years. It happened in the context of surgery, which I had to undergo. And it was like a med you know standard medical procedure at the time performed on many kids. Um, however, and here's a little bit of context that I need to proceed in order to you know, to make it kind of better understandable for our audience. Uh, I had already been um, committed to a, a, a pediatric ward, I'd have to say, a hospital uh, in infancy, two weeks old. I was, so I have to just briefly describe that in order to to set up the, you know, the situation and, and to, to make uh, audience understand why my NDE was of that nature. So as a kid, I get born, my birth was natural one, no C-section, nothing, nothing traumatic whatsoever. There's a little bit of an addendum for later about that, but it was a natural birth. It was, I was healthy. I was a little small. I was short. I was, uh, I looked a little undernourished and the nurse uh, and my mother was concerned and the nurse goes, well, everything is there. What are you complaining about? You know, so she kind of cheered it up. Uh, however, I was not strong enough to be uh, naturally breastfed, to be nourished uh, the natural way. And back in those days, it was customary for doctors to just, you know, take the kid away and then feed him formula, which is like a uh, little, little bottle with uh, milk and uh, vegetables blended in. And the milk part, the dairy part, I didn't learn until I was 42 that I'm intolerant to dairy. It was cow's dairy you know and so I uh, couldn't keep it down mm -hmm. and uh, I wouldn't take on weight and as an infant all you have to do is you know let me put it this way you know suck your mother's breast and mm -hmm. be happy and marry and that's all all you had you're supposed to do as an infant so this didn't work out and the doctors tried to feed me formula and my mother tried to breastfeed again I don't think they had the, the thing like pumping and, and mm -hmm. preserving and I don't think it was known at the time Long story short, the doctor, the local doctor, who was not a pediatrician, but just a general uh, uh, medical doctor, um, strongly suggests to my mother to take me to a hospital to get checked out because she was at the end of her tether. She didn't know what was going on. So they take me there. And back in those days, you have to imagine this was like in the late 60s, mm -hmm. 70s, you know, on the verge of uh, the decade. Just in, I was born 65, so I'm kind of an older guy. Um, back in those days, there was no thing like rooming in or things like that. And and even getting there, and it was an hour's drive away. We didn't have a car. My family didn't own a car. There was no public transportation where you, you know, hop on a train or something. So it was kind of um, an act for them to get me there. And then they finally get me there. And the doctor tells me, tells my parents, um, well, uh, from from apparently from what they were describing, they couldn't make sense of it. And they said, well, it's, it's best if you, uh, you know, if you kept them here for a couple mm -hmm. of days to check them and check them out thoroughly. It turned out it wasn't a couple of days, it was weeks on end wow. and I was alone. 
and uh, I was in isolation. Mm -hmm. Basically, it was a real quarantine situation. And like I said, back in those days, my parents couldn't come visit regularly. So that in and of itself, that is abandonment trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I'm not the only one. Many kids at that age, you know, my, my, my uh, ex-wife, unfortunately, we had to get divorced. But I was deeply in love with her. She had the same thing happen to her. Her mother was a single mom. Back in those days, as a single mom, you were like, I don't know, you were like an outcast, you know, mm -hmm. and, and 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 people didn't take kindly to it. So she had to send her daughter uh, um, to one of those institutions where nurses would look out for her while she tried to make money. And I'm just, you know, that's the context we have to understand because it's vastly different from today. You know, it, it it's unheard of today that that you would do something with your kid. So that in and of itself, there's trauma right there, right? Yeah. Um, even if you overcome that, and, and my mother tells me when she had me back home, I kind of developed normally, quote unquote, you know, like like any other kid. And yeah, there are pictures of me where I look like a happy camper, you know, like <laughs> really yeah. uh, um well fed and 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 you know happy but there are other pictures too where i don't look so happy as an infant so let's just let's just uh for the record let's just say this is not the, the best optimal way for a young infant to come into this world okay yeah. that said um come, going back at, at age four uh, and by that time, you have a sense of, I am different from you. You can speak, you can walk, you know, at four years, you're beginning to become a person. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. So um, I was mildly put, I was apprehensive learning that I would have to go back to a hospital and stay there alone again, no roaming in. And my parents apparently noticed my apprehension slash fear mm -hmm. slash terror <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which it turned out into then later and uh and and, and tell me you know uh, well that's the best we can do and it just needs to be done it's not going to be too difficult and it's not going to be long we take you there you fall asleep the next day you barely notice anything they give you the, the anesthesia and you know they try to soothe you okay mm -hmm. excuse me uh so i go in they take off they were asked to drive away the same day and i'm apprehensive is a mild way of putting it i'm working myself into plain terror mm -hmm. and uh because this te the technical term would be this was a full-blown re-traumatization mm -hmm. of course mm -hmm. it's a hospital you go under you have something happen to you which you have no reference of frame of reference um, but I had because of my first days in the hospital. So it would have been difficult for any kid. And uh, with that background already, I became convinced on the next morning when the nurse wakes me up to prep me for, for surgery, I became convinced they had dropped you here for good now mm. because they want to get rid of you for good. You're not going to get operated on. You're going to get killed on the table. Mm. That, that's the thought yeah. that somehow settled into my mind and I was you know this is um this is not really self like you could frame this as negative self-talk or something but that went on autopilot it was not I wouldn't have known how to control mm -hmm. this fear you know this right. terror that was creeping up in me so that is um the preceding story and then I go under uh well the nurse wakes me up the next morning she gives me a sedative you know a, a pill I don't register any effect on me and I'm still totally hyper agitated and hyper mm -hmm. um, aroused. And I asked the nurse and the feeling, if I look, if, if not only look back, but if I put myself into that, I mean, this is something I have to explain later. The feelings came back spontaneously in 2009, 40 mm -hmm. years late. I had forgotten about this, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So the nurse wakes me up, she gives me the sedative. And I feel like these are the last minutes of your life. You go on to die. And the thing is, which only occurred to me later, why would I know anything about death at that time? Mm -hmm. I can't remember. I didn't remember that anybody had, I had not seen even an animal die or anything like that at that age. Right. I was too young, you know? So yeah. how, how could this 
you know, becomes such a strong conviction, like your life is about to end here. Mm. And truth be told, I don't have a good answer. I would have to speculate. But my my strong personal, excuse me, theory is that um, it was about life and death in the beginning. And the body, your your physical part of your being, the nervous system, that registers when when you're in uh, immediate danger of death mm -hmm. or even if you're just thinking. And that is something that the entire literature of NDE research has. Dr. Bruce Grayson has been doing research 40 years. Dr. Pimman Lommel, cardiologist. They all say the same thing. It is sufficient to be under the strong impression that you're about to die. Let's say you're in a car. It's winter now. It's winter. The roads are icy. Um, you slip, you know, the car slips. And you're you're seeing yourself crashing or, or you know headed for that abyss and going over the cliff and at that moment something kicks in which is not your usual mode of thinking and planning ahead it's just something that happens on autopilot and even people approaching death on their deathbed you know like terminally ill or just old and dying of old age they seem the same thing about two weeks prior to actually passing on people notice a difference in their body physically. So my theory would be that I felt the same thing as a dying person felt on the deathbed or approaching physical passing on. And that's why this thought became so prominent in my mind. That's that's probably the only explanation I have for myself. And I'm hoping it, it sounds at least semi-plausible and semi- mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So um, I go in. The nurse, uh, I asked whether I can walk to the operating theater. No, I have to be placed in the wheelchair, of course, you know, and they drive you there. It felt, I later watched the Green Mile several times and I cannot watch it without getting emotional. And why yeah. not? You know, why not get emotional? Why not? That That's a very natural way of processing these things. So so it was actually that feeling like you're on death row. Right. These are the last minutes. I would assume that that convicts, you know, for criminal uh, uh, capital punishment, feel exactly that, and that's what the movie reflects. And 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 so, yeah, I um, I get prepped for surgery. Um, the nurse explains to me that she's going to put me under with a inhalation mask. It was not done IV, but uh, oh. you, you had this kind of a, <laughs> yeah. a metal mesh, you know, with a, with a gaze, I mean, like, like a cloth, which right. was drenched in this, you know, and then they would push it on your, on your face, which is, you can't imagine how difficult it was for me with COVID yeah. and everything. Yeah. Um, but I wore the mask. I was, I was, I was, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, anyways, um, I, I start fighting for my life. I'm four years old, this tiny boy, three nurses come in and fixate me basically brutally physically mm. and the nurse um, puts the mask on my face and i lose consciousness and the last mm. thought is um that's it mm. gonna die and the nde was after that and that's what i forgot because the psyche works like that mm -hmm. things that are just too overwhelming and that would also be the definition of trauma any kind of coping strategy if you have developed any until then and i was four years yeah do i know about coping the things you just asked me you know you don't have that available as a yeah player. so there's no coping but if you right. did have coping strategies um until then uh and that that's it that's also what makes it so difficult to treat trauma is because there's sharp trauma and there's complex trauma and there's you know there's a whole body of literature on that but that's why it's probably the most difficult um condition to treat with a with a human being yeah because um so many aspects factor in so i fight for my life they fixate me i go under you lost the fight you're dying that was my last conscious thought and then only later that's when the nde in the void tub experience happened and that is something that i had repressed successfully quote unquote from memory for 40 years. Wow. In uh, in 2009, I remember, and, and here's the interesting thing. Something, well, okay, I'm kind of um, 
jumping back and forth. Forgive me for that because it's so much information that, that, that you know, I need to structure it. I understand. I have the void type experience. Okay, let's let's continue with that. And the feeling was, like I said earlier, the feeling was, um, okay, you're dead now, but why can you think? You're not supposed to think when you're dead. That was the first thought, but it was a conscious thought. And I was just amazed. It's not the right way to put it, but it was just, well, surprised at the very least surprised. And I didn't expect that. I mean, I expected to be my consciousness obliterated, you know, like no consciousness. You're gone. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Which is what dualists and materialists and what most people still believe in, you know, like uh, once the body dies, that's it. That, you know, mm -hmm. you have your life and that's over and, and okay. But again, this is just me speaking about these things in retrospect. As a kid, I didn't have a concept of an afterlife. I didn't, I didn't even have a, a like a religious uh, um, education or anything like that. I was in the, in kindergarten, yes, and it was run by nurses, so maybe I've heard of Jesus Christ or the church, but mm -hmm. not really like a like a, a um, precise idea as to what should I believe in and you know how does the afterlife what could it look like and what's you know what's what's yeah. the store for me didn't have any concept of that of that uh, nature so the thought was you're dead but why can you think you're not supposed to think mm -hmm. and then a sort of um how should I put it like an inner monologue started but all this in the absence of any kind of light form I mean no a concept of any reference that I could cling on to. The only reference, the only point of, well, the only experience at the time was you're still able to think. That was the only thing that was there. You're mm -hmm. not supposed to be thinking any longer. And I wouldn't even say that it was in sense of identity of like this is young me thinking thoughts without a body. I mean, technically, yes, that is exactly what happened, but but I didn't think or feel that way at in this experience while it was going on. And then so it, I was uh, at least surprised and uh, and um, still in in terror, of course, here, of course, you know, I was I was by myself and and I'm thinking, well, you know, like crap, if if that's all there is, if I'm like rele uh, relegated to this nothingness now with just one thought, and that's exactly what it was. It was like this, the speckle of consciousness placed in an infinite sea of nothingness. No angels, no light, no form, no nothing. Later, during the experience, the memory of my family returned. Like, um, what was that? You know, like, where's my family? Where's mm -hmm. what's what happened to my life? What, you know, where's all that? And then the kind of inner monologue transformed into or morphed into some sort of um communication telepathic communication something along those lines like it was it, it felt like my own thoughts were reverberated back to me like a confirmation or an affirmation yeah exactly you're gone your life doesn't exist anymore never existed you did not exist your family was all a hoax it never existed none of that ever existed none of it ever will uh bottom line creation or what you thought and ex you have experienced it was a hoax we let you believe it this is all there is and that's all there's ever gonna be it was horrible it yeah was that's horrible yeah utter terror mm -hmm. and um yeah just I didn't know, you know, I had no idea how to handle that. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it felt it felt absolutely impossible to to handle, mm -hmm. <laughs> like stuck in nothingness forever mm -hmm. and forever. Mm -hmm. And that's all it was ever going to be. Excuse me. Pardon me. So. Um, to this day, I, I, I can't really answer too well how I got out of it, but some mm -hmm. sort of uh, rebellious well, you know, like feeling set in like this sucks. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, I mean, I didn't exactly think this sucks, but it's like oh, I mean, it's really crap. I'm I'm mm -hmm. kind of uh, there's no hope. It's hopeless. Right. And um, but but this this resilient thought of 
this being unacceptable or intolerable became stronger. And mm -hmm. then this inner monologue um, or telepathic communication morphed into almost like a dialogue. And I did hear, I later learned uh, from, a, from a similar NDE uh, recounted by uh, Nancy Evans Bush, who uh, coincidentally was uh, the director of the IONS in the beginning oh, of the year. Oh, wow. Yeah, or co-director. And mm -hmm. she was surprised to hear all these blissful NDEs, and and mm -hmm. she had her own in the in the process of in the context of uh, giving birth to her, to her, I think her second child, and I think it, she lost it during the experience or something. Mm -hmm. But it was it was pretty similar, and and this detail about these clicking circles that looked a little bit like yin and yang, like mm -hmm. you know, like like um, hovering mm -hmm. somewhere to my upper right somewhere, you know, like and and, and then. Um, clicking while they were changing color from black ah. to white and, and, and back and, and you know like um, excuse me my my um, soma is acting up because this is of course charged with um, some feelings okay uh -huh. um, or maybe I had too much coffee <laughs> <laughs> um, this aspect I had forgotten also about my NDE for a long time but as it came back in this instantaneous flashback in 2009, without any kind of preceding uh, situation that could have mm. brought it about, it was just out of the blue. It was wow. all there in an instant. Huh. All there in an instant. Ex including um, all the terror mm. and, and all the panic. And those wow. panic attacks I've been having as a child whenever... I was um, moved out of um, my sister and I shared a room until I was eight years old, nine years old. Mm -hmm. And then we were asked, my, my parents um, kind of felt like one room for two uh, uh, children is, is too small. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, it was suggested or, uh, you know, basically I was told I would get the room upstairs in the uh, floor above our, our floor, uh, we lived in my grandfather's house. And so this was kind of a, it was removed from the family context. And that's when the panic attack, the night terrors actually mm -hmm. started. And so I, I, as a kid, and this goes back to you asking, what can you do about it? As a, as a, as a young boy, I was in school, high school, uh, high school later, in, uh, here elementary school as a young boy, I didn't, I felt like at eight, nine years old, you're too old to go to, you know, into your parents' uh, bedroom and ask to, so. I had to do something. I had to become creative. And um, what I found, and this worked for some time, at least to work, was like um, when this terror would set in. I mean, this like uh, people who ever felt threatened, their life threatened, like soldiers, firefighters, anyone who's ever actually encountered such a situation, they will know what I'm talking about. When that kind of stress sets in, again, there's a sort of autopilot mode that your body or your inner wisdom your somatic wisdom let's call it that it kicks in and takes over and it really takes over your actions and your thoughts and this is not anything you can control if the stress level gets to that point where you feel like you your life or someone else's life is in danger i've talked to uh veterans of war in my country who came back from tours in, in afghanistan also with trauma and ptsd I've, I've uh, read many accounts of uh, soldiers coming back from Iraq and the tours that they were sent on. Actually, I had a um, almost fiancé at the time who was with the military, with uh, military intelligence, uh, an officer. She tells me all this. So long story short is there is this commonality of your body just knowing what's right in the situation to... Uh, heighten your chances of survival mm -hmm. and that is also a very important aspect i can't stress enough in trauma uh, care and it ties back into ndes because i see the same thing happening to returning nde ears when they come back to the into the body as blissful as it might have been on the other side they get to all these celestial realms and you know they meet angels or uh pass on relatives and and so on and so forth but once they're back in the body it's really difficult. Yeah. And I see I see trauma uh, outcomes 
time and time again with any return to any year from, from my personal research. So the autopilot mode that your body takes into is the older part of our brains and mm -hmm. it's the better the limbic practice system. one. Yeah, the limbic yeah, the system. Limbics, yeah, yeah, the amygdala, the limbic system, the hippocampus. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and that's also where the care needs to, uh, to focus on, you know, mm -hmm. you need to work with the body You need to include your body. And that's why I appreciate you asking about what helps you day to day. Mm -hmm. Breathing is one thing. And it's all about, um, getting the, the parasympathetic, yes. um, the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. system. Yeah. System. It feels exactly. safe. Mm -hmm. That is the one that brings you down. The sympathetic yeah. system is the one that, uh, charges you for fight flight. Right or freeze, shock freeze. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the parasympathetic system is the one that, you know, counters that effect. So, right. so whenever you, that's why I said anything activating that part of your brain, and you have to become, of course, you have to become mindful about your somatic response. Like if you encounter something uncomfortable, try to become aware of what preceded it, what happened before, was I under stress before going in, was I not, was it spontaneous, you know? But there are limitations. I have to warn our, our audience, I mean, it works so so far, but if a bear attacks you and starts to maul, right. breathing is not going to save you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So there's that, but but it's still important, and mm -hmm. and the important aspect is not only that it works in the moment, hopefully, but it also helps to retrain your overcharged nervous system over a longer yes. period of time. Because the experience of not the knowingness, that is totally irrelevant. The mm -hmm. experience is what helps your uh, your brain to unlearn all these um, stressful states. Exactly. Yeah, 100%. So after the NDE, um, and then you had the recall in 2009, um, you also had some kind of experience, like a, I don't know if it was a pre-birth thing, but you had remembered, um, kind of a mm. conversation, if you will, mm. about mm. your mm. life here. And do you feel comfortable sharing a little bit more about that? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Again, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, this sounds self-lettering, but it's not meant in a way, but it, uh, it's kind of fascinating how, how much smart responses our systems have you know uh, how wise our bodies are mm -hmm. i'm saying this because um this memory and more memories keep coming in, keep coming back ever since uh, this happened after before this flashback in 2009 which brought back my which unlocked um the memory of my own nde at age four kind of retrieved it from the vault if you want to put it that way mm -hmm. yeah uh, before that, I had, um, well, life had become pretty difficult um, after my divorce already, you know, like um, trauma or not, you know, life spares nobody. <laughs> I mean, here's the bad news. Sorry, people, you know, I mean, we're just subject to anything anybody else can experience. So um, life had become a little bit difficult. And at the time, um, whenever there's adversity, for me, at least that's how I learned how to operate um later in life is you know like if there's a problem you need to confront it you know and and then if it's a complex situation break it down into smaller bits try to solve the equal you know the the, the individual bits and bring it back together and hopefully this is going to work it, it actually did work and, and and served me well in my in my previous career as a project manager and, and tech consultant so yeah it, it's a concept that at least for me worked well you know uh -huh. and, and so i thought about my trauma um, history, mm -hmm. I didn't know about trauma until 2008. And at that time, I saw um, a medical doctor who had specialized in clinical hypnosis and hypnotherapy, um, following the teachings of, uh, what was it, Eric Milton Erickson or something? Uh, I think that was the name. So he was specialized, uh, he was specializing, he had specialized in, in that to the extent that police investigators would rely on his services when they were at the end of the tether in a, in a criminal wow. investigation, because sometimes it helps, you know, with some people, it helps to remember information that they may have also forgotten about. For, for example, if it's a traumatic situation and right. because the, the, the psyche always, 
our our conscious mind is basically the listener to a storyteller, mm. if I could put it that way. Our minds, our conscious minds, always need to have a story that they can sign off on, you know, like go along with. Yeah. And if there's something that that tells you you're just prey and and you're helpless, that is not something that the mind takes too kindly. You know, it cannot live. It can you cannot go on functioning in that mode apparently. So your mind will always make stories that need only to sound consistent, consistent, and make sense. And as long as something make something makes sense, you get back to your functioning normal day to day mode. And and uh, so so even in criminal situations, sometimes even if it's the perpetrator, they may not remember all the details because maybe something was you know unpleasant to them as they were attacking someone else or something. So um, with hypnosis, it 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 is not a hundred percent reliable. I mean, to me, it's it's surprising that criminal investigators take that information and do something about it, you know, and work with that. Yeah. To me, yeah, it, was, yeah. it was the first time. Yeah, it was the first time I ever heard of that. So I was mm -hmm. kind of surprised, you know. But he was such an expert, um, a known expert in my country in that regard that. Um, when they didn't know any any you know, how to go on else, they would call him up and he would, you know, uh, put those people in a mild trance. And it's only a mild trance. You you don't really feel it yourself. You know, I was surprised. I thought it was going to be more dramatic, like you see on TV with these shows. Right. You know, yeah. And people do all the, the most craziest uh, things, and it was not like that at all. Okay. I didn't almost. It, it was almost as if I didn't feel anything. And. Hmm. So anyways, I go in, I have a couple of uh, a small, uh, a series of, of hypnotherapy sessions, which was totally unrelated to the trauma. It was about purely about my, my uh, physical symptoms. I, mm -hmm. I had digestive problems, you know, in, in my situation. Basically, um, I, I keep saying today, I feel like it, I'm in, in, back in the body of a, of a four-year-old, mm -hmm. which is actually what happened after my flashback in 2009. I, the next morning um, after the panic attack in, at night, that woke me up. I go to to my kitchen sink. I want to, you know, uh, fill a, fill a glass of water and drink. And on the way there, I pass out. I crash on the floor. I, I fall down. I'm unconscious wow. for a couple of minutes. I come to. I have a laceration, like a gaping wound in the chin. I need to go to hospital. And the next morning, I wake up and I feel like a four year old. So that's the shortest wow. version of where I'm at today. Wow. And and it was about these symptoms that had that had um, taken over. I mean, like now I'm mixing up the times a little bit, but these symptoms have been with me forever. Yeah. Not as strongly as they were after the flashback, mm -hmm. but they had been present in my body forever. Like, I mean, I, I remember going into meetings or even just driving into work in the mornings. I would, you know, I would arrive there and I felt like I come from a, a marathon run or something yeah. like a, it was, it was horrible. It was very uncomfortable to live mm -hmm. like that you know it still is and taxing physically taxing so it was about those things and that's before I even kn knew about my own trauma and trauma at mm -hmm. large uh, I just wanted to do something about it I didn't want to go on like you know arriving at work and needing to right. change my shirt because I'm sweating like buckets and, and, and <laughs> yeah. like that yeah so um that's what it was about there okay. was no talk of no conscience, uh, uh, consciousness in, in myself, no awareness of trauma at all. This was just, let's do something about that, which is most immediate, which goes back to my being organized and structured. Here's a problem. Let's face it, you know, let's <laughs> do something about it. So that's how I ended up there. But the interesting thing is after I've ended the sessions, um, five months later, all these memories keep wow. flooding in start flooding and among them and finally i'm answering your question uh among them was one memory that that was like before coming in into the body before insolment whatever you call it there's there are all these terms before that happened um i have to laugh because it was like Again, it's like like you're at the uh, uh, you know like the start before a race and before yeah. the starting gun. That's what it felt like, and and uh -huh. like now is the time. You know, here's your body. This is the couple. This is where you're gonna come into the physical. And I'm no, this is too hard. You gotta be kidding me. No <laughs> way, I'm gonna do that. I like that. Like really 
strongly, staunchly rejecting the experience. Physically incarnating? Not me. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Uh, you can deny the experience or forego, forego the experience and there won't be any reprimand. There won't be any consequences. However, and these again are like guys or something talking back to me. It's kind of a, it's hard to put it into words. It's like almost like a, you, it's it's hard to discern uh, between inner monologue or is it yeah. really you know it, it it feels as if it's a dialogue but but there's no one there right i didn't see anyone sometimes people see guides and, and uh -huh. angels and whatnot it wasn't like that it was just like there was some kind of back talk you know like yes. um however if you did um decide to go through with it yes it's going to be difficult yes you signed up for it excuse me yes we know it's going to be hard but you get through it and if you decided to go through with it you'll be promised you'll never ever have to decide to incarnate on earth ever again and this sounded like okay it's still a shitty deal but it's a fair deal you know <laughs> yeah and, like and mm. part of my french here i mean maybe you have to bleep it out or something but um <laughs> it felt like like okay yeah it didn't really appeal all that much altogether right away either but it felt like yeah maybe i can do this it's going to be for for a short while and and okay i was still reluctant mm -hmm. and the last thing i remember before actually apparently being given birth by my mother the last thing i remember was um me talking back and saying okay i'm gonna do it but let's get it over quick with can we shall we you know like that <laughs> and and it, it ironically and coincidentally and that would make sense my mother tells me she had barely gone into labor and i popped out you know like it was like maybe two three hours of labor yeah. and i was i was there like she 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 uh she called it i could not wait to be born that's how she put it always you know used to put it so wow it, it would make sense but i mean of course we're here in an area in an arena where there is never going to be any proof these are totally personal excuse me i'm have to these are totally personal experiences and uh, whether or not anybody can go along with it, it's, any, it's anyone's choice and guess. Uh, this is just, for someone, I mean, I guess I'm preaching to the choir, for anyone having had spiritually, spiritually transformative experiences or NDEs or OBEs, anyone having experienced them, there is no doubt. They know mm -hmm. that is what they experienced. Right. Which is true of any experience a person can make, right? I mean, we mm -hmm. all act from our own frame of reference of what we have experienced right. and the conclusions we derive, the learnings we take away from those. That's how everybody and their dog operates, even mm -hmm. dogs really seriously. I mean, like from experience. And, and so this is the whole frame of knowledge that we, as we go along in life, rely on anyone. So whatever happens to you, first matters to you and and nothing else much matters at at first of course later as we grow up and start to you know like negotiate things and and so on and yada yada but um like i said i mean there's never going to be any proof so when i'm speaking about these things it sounds like yeah well you made it up and you were in terror you were a child and you know it's you could also frame it from a totally different naturalist perspective and it would make sense too Mm -hmm. I, I can't object that you know i couldn't argue with that you could look at it any way you wanted to but for oneself undergoing the experience what you experience there what you feel what you think that is what matters does that answer oh your, yeah your absolutely and so do you think having all these things come back do you think that was like your kind of catalyst for kind of like waking up essentially like what's going on here like wow, all of this stuff is coming back to me. Um, you know, I'm starting to remember that the void experience, it gets you starting to think about consciousness and the existence existence of consciousness after, you know, death and all of that. So do you, did that lead to in to some kind of spiritual awakening? And how did that go for you since 2009? Mm -hmm. Okay. I have to answer that in two parts. The first part is I had always been interested in these topics and now it makes sense to me why that is. I had always loved science fiction literature. When Moody's book came out in 1975, I was like, what was that, 10 years old? It was <laughs> released in English at, in, in 1975. It came, you know, translated version in, in my country was like 78 or something. So it was uh -huh. 12, 13, something. 
And we didn't have Google or, or Amazon Kindle or something like that at the time. I mean, was there was your local library, right. your school books, textbooks, exactly. and your local library. And I would find those books, you know, like science fiction, Stanislav Lem, Isaac Asimov. Um, I remember there was this thick thing, like a volume, the World Almanac of um, Paranormal Phenomena. It Ooh. kind of attracted me. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I... That, that is the first part of the answer. I was always kind of interested in these topics. And I would assume in retrospect that it was because some part of me still remembered the NDE, yes. uh, the void experience at age uh -huh. four, but not consciously. But somehow, even at that young age, as a, as a preteen, other people start dating, making out and, and stuff. And I would delve deeply into these things and, yeah. and music and nature always... So I've always been connected to these realms, shall we say, that are not the mainstream. So that's the first part of my answer. The second part is um, the actual reason for me to, to go as deeply as I did or have been since 2000, actually 2009 and following years. At first it was like, I was really looking for like, making it easier for myself and maybe even an exit route, you know, like, a, like, can't we cut it short? Like something <laughs> like that. I don't, yeah. don't want to say the word, you know, what, where it's going, but, right. but something like, uh, and I feel like done, you know, like, so at first I came from the exact opposite from the atheist view. Like mm -hmm. I needed to prove to myself, there's total blackout. There's total blackness. None of this of it is ever going to happen again. You die, you're gone, you're done. That's it. You know, that's, that was the impetus at first. Mm -hmm. because I was in a dark place at the time following that Andy that Andy that that flashback and, and and feeling so helpless again but then the evidence suggesting that there's so much more was even for me who I would say has a strong analytical mind first and you know kind of always was semi-open to these other concepts but you you talked about awakening. I, I would say that the awakening started as as soon as I really took in the information and looked at the information and vetted it and looked at it hard. Mm -hmm. And then there were these things that there's no explanation, no natural naturalist explanation for. Even today, they they Dr. Bruce Grayson, he's on a, he appeared on a couple of podcasts. I think Alex Ferrari had him on a couple of times. I talked to by the way, I, I did interviews for for uh, for a channel here on on YouTube uh, where where I got to talk to Doctor uh, to Professor Jim Tucker of uh, DOPS at uh, University of Virginia. They are looking into reincarnation memories of young children. It started with Ian Stevenson. Uh, he started that work in the '60s. Uh, he went to the Far East. He had a mentor, a sponsor who would sponsor his trips, and he he really he basically was like like a criminalist um, criminal investigator he would look at these reports because it was more often there you know like reincarnation memories so anyways um uh, all the evidence for consciousness at least not totally depending on the physical let's put it that way cautiously at least we can say that you know from all the ndes from all the cardiac arrests from people having conscious uh, 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 memory of an experience at a time when all that science has to share and know about at this point, it should have been impossible for them to have a conscious experience. And they still do. And mm -hmm. they can recount it. And the thing is that that, that almost is almost like a proof or semi-proof they tell you about things they did not know and could not have known prior to the experience. They they have experiences like it's called peak in Darren phenomenon, like information that they couldn't possibly have had. Anja, uh, um, what's her name? Anya Mojani or Angela Mojani. She's she's one of those. She knew about her brother boarding a plane to come see her because she was terminally ill with cancer, wow. and she knew about him having boarded that plane thousands of miles away where she was physically at the time that she was had basically died wow she knew about that and later turned out it was right and things like that you know or <laughs> even funny things there was one patient undergoing cardiac arrest a elderly uh, gentleman 
and he had dentures or what is it called like like uh you know you take them off is it dentures mm -hmm. yes you have to take them out before intubation or the nurse has to take them out and he misplaced them somewhere where this gentleman after coming to couldn't find him any longer and he said oh well, it was that gentleman he he misplaced them he must know where they are you know he, they couldn't find his dentures after he was awakening from the from the procedure <laughs> and things like that i mean yeah you know, like, how did how he, could he have how known? Would he known that yeah i remember being that, an right. nd as well where this woman um left her body and and went above the hospital building and saw a random shoe on the roof and you could not see this shoe that was like from out a window or anything like that. So there's no way that she would have known that. And it was there. Yeah. So I remember that story. I, oh, I you do? The story too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We read yeah, the absolutely. same one. <laughs> we read the same thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there were so many and, and, and things like that of that nature. Like, you know, you can't you basically have to say, I, I have no idea. You know, anybody with a, even if you if you put logic to it, logical thinking to it, there is no explanation she could have known. And yet right. it turned out to be affirmed, uh, uh, to be affirmed by by third parties who were yes, and not only that, but it's like this goes around the world in every person that in different kind of background, race, religion, have had these experiences. So that to me also shows that it's universal. Um, you know, when you can get a global perspective from different countries and cultures and all of that. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So these these aspects about these, um, shall we say, non-ordinary experiences, um, they kind of uh, hammered the message in like, yeah, you can't be you can't be sure that your consciousness is going to zap out and that's it. You just can't. You, there's no proof to the contrary either, you know, like so. From an analytical standpoint, I had to sit myself down and realize ah, you can't rule it out you know right exactly with, with all the information that's there it's likely that if you went out early you just remove yourself from your body and then what you don't have a body to, to transform your your feeling center and then mm -hmm. maybe you're back in that void and then what you know that that's really crappy then you know you know so really i'm a strong warning and and people you know going out early keep telling the same thing they find themselves in bad situations you know and then you don't know how to to move away from, out of those situations sometimes mm -hmm. they get rescued yes and sometimes they call for help and they're rescued but yes long story short about consciousness we still don't understand the first thing about consciousness is my is my uh, preliminary uh, conclusion here well maybe the first thing but not the second thing and not the third thing and apparently not how it works and and my uh at this point, excuse me, at this point, my theory would be that indigenous people knew so much more. They had so much more spiritual wisdom about how our human consciousness works because apparently there can be other types of consciousness anywhere in the cosmos, in the universe. Mm -hmm. But our, our, our human, um, there seems to be something specific to human consciousness as is true for, for animals. Animals, I mean, there are people like animal communicators there's a person called Anna Breitenbach in uh, South Africa she's originally from there she's a consultant in that area she manages to successfully communicate with animals non-linguistically just from mentally telepathically I don't know how she does it but wow. she's so good at what she does she transforms animals which were taken out of the wild into into like uh, rehabilitation centers and and you could say uh, almost like um, animals, wild, formerly wild animals with a behavioral disorder, and she she cures them. She wow. she addresses them. She she connects with them. Even animals in the wild, they're. I mean, if you can find her on 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 YouTube, this is really heartwarming and touching and so impressive how she manages to instantaneously get those animals not only to trust her but apparently have some form of non-linguistic non-verbal communication going on with them in ways that work out you know like like there's this story where she uh where someone with such a what's it called um uh, they had a, a a black leopard and the leopard was uh, it had been isolated from his uh from his cubs or from his tribe or whatever you call it um 
and it was like in agony and it was angry and it mm. was dangerous and the people running the, the park um were thinking of putting him down because they, he would not eat he would attack his you know it was just impossible to to get him well and she was called to help and my goodness i get emotional thinking about it oh. and in the first because these are living beings i mean that's mm -hmm. you know yeah in the first session she has with him after she takes off the animal is transformed whoa they get to approach him they get to feed him they get to integrate him with the rest of the wow um, and he is basically a good guy you know a, a team player ever since and uh, things like and there's there's a documentary it's like a a little bit under an hour you can watch it you can find oh it that sounds YouTube. fascinating yeah anna anna brighton buck is her name with a okay. y bright brighton buck e a c t h t and this documentary is there and, and anybody watching with an open mind and, and you know with focus and attention must understand something is going on there they can't have fabricated that there are yeah. even even the the person who called her a uh, uh, call on her services he was like he's being interviewed afterwards he he gets emotional too because he just couldn't take it. It's like a miracle. He, yeah. Yeah, it was a miracle. And he he said before she arrived, he said, it's gonna take a lot for me to be convinced. He was like, <laughs> maybe his wife heard about her, you know, and she suggested, you know, we don't know what to do. Let's call her. And he's yeah, yeah, yeah. All his woo -woo, you know, he doesn't say it, but you can you can tell that he thinks along those lines. And he's like, and the, the polite way of saying is that it's going to take a lot for me to be convinced. And he is, he's transformed also <laughs> from that encounter. So, wow. yeah, I mean, consciousness works in ways which we are just now beginning to understand. But now is also a fascinating time because now we have all these instruments to measure physical correlation of what happens when mm -hmm. and under what circumstances. There was never a better time to really take a hard look at consciousness. And, and there's quantum research and quantum mechanics, which may factor in. I don't want to over -exagger exaggerate it. It's, it's, it's like, it's not a panacea, but it might also be a play here at some point. There's Dr. Yes. Stuart Hemeroff, uh, he and, and Sir Roger Penrose, who is a staunch physical, the I mean, uh, 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 theoretical physicist, you know. Mm -hmm. They uh, came up with a theory called orchestrated um, objective reduction in order to potentially explain conscious thought, why we have consciousness in the first place, like reflective awareness. I would have to say consciousness is, is not the best. For me, it's more like about awareness where you can sit back and almost like a, a, a second instance uh, watching your actions and your own thoughts. And that's yes. what meditators... Being the observer, right. About. Thing. it's and there's this um and it's also in the bible the holy trinity there's mm. it's called the holy ghost or spirit mm -hmm. source whatever you want to call it this underlying uh substrate of conscious potential or proto-consciousness mm -hmm. as dr hammer calls it and then there is um our day-to-day -day minds our uh mickey mouse mind i call, yes. I call it our monkey mind <laughs> monkey, monkey mind, mind yeah monkey mind that's the word um, and then there's also the observers. So, so there's this threefold uh, right. system at work here. And that's been documented and talked about in all the ancient traditions ages ago, yeah. centuries, I mean, millennia ago. So we know that this is at play. Mm -hmm. Just materialists or uh, dualists and, you know, like... Um, naturalistic uh, scientists, they still reject it. Like, no, 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 it's just the brain. And no, it's not just the brain. We know mm -hmm. that much. Yet. Mm -hmm. We know that much already. Yeah, I was reading that article on your blog um, about, um, I forget the gentleman's name who wrote it, but um, how the body, it, it's not so much the brain because they did that scan of that gentleman in his brain and yeah. there was just cerebral fru fluid, but yet exactly. married <laughs> yeah. man living... <laughs> A normal life and there's like yeah. no brain up there um but it's yeah. more like yeah. the cells and this is coming from yeah. bruce lipton too because um i've read a lot yeah. of his yeah. 
material as well, the cell responds to what is giving it, given in its environment. Um, exactly. And so, you know, and then that works into like epigenetics and all of that. And um, currently I'm, I'm about to read, uh, I listened to a little bit of it on audiobook, but Dr. Joe Dispenza has the, the yeah. habit, breaking the habit of being yourself. I think that's the name of the book, but um, this is going to help with retraining, uh, hopefully like in a way of using my mind, training my system to let it know it's okay. Cause as a trauma survivor, you, like you said, you're like the littlest thing can put you into, uh, fight or flight mode. You know, it, when it's just a, a simple stressor, your body is not, it's seeing it as almost it's, Oh, this must be the trauma again. And so it, you know, I'm always feeling like I'm having to calm the nervous system. So like if, if I can try to use some of these techniques that I hope to learn in that book, perhaps I can turn certain genes on or off, you know, um, and, and improve my health. And again, it, it kind of goes with like mind over matter. Um, and, you know, I'm always looking for examples of people who have done that, you know, because it is hard. <laughs> It's not an easy yeah. thing to retrain the brain. And, um, you know, you have to, like you said, use binaural beats or meditations or breathe, breath work, um, going under for hypnotherapy or listen to subliminal messages. That's another one that I do as well, as well as, you know, affirmation. There's just so many things we can throw at it, but it's like, we have to be very vigilant because our, yeah. our, base mode from trauma is ah something's out to get me like I'm not safe and so we it, it's a whole retraining of the brain yeah absolutely so, you, you, yeah you, you said it beautifully well especially for me I mean the first things I, I almost the first things is like people human beings when they're around you that means pain that means yeah. terror that means bad things so to retrain that but you said it beautifully wasn't uh, just a, a quick thing. Wasn't Dispenza also the one who came up with this biocentrism theory, biocentric, something like that? I think I remember. You probably know better than I do. Okay. <laughs> uh, just just a tidbit, just on a side note. But yeah, um, um, there's also a neurobiologic explanation why it is so hard and difficult and why you have to become really adamant at it, you know, like consistent, persistent with, with the retraining and unlearning. Because there's the thing in naturally, which is called negativity bias. We learn more from from bad things because they are, you know, the stronger. They're more obvious. You know, if you're mm -hmm. almost mauled by, to death by a bear, that's something you remember first. Because there's emotion attached to it. Yeah, right. and fortunately, it's the the brain is kind of wired like that to remember yeah. that more yeah. so it's already yeah. an yeah. extra yeah. challenge on top of it's, that yeah. and, and and every time and that that is why why trauma therapy has to be so so uh, to, to be so careful about you know not getting re-traumatized every time it kicks back in it takes only one aspect and usually it's a sensual uh thing like for example a smell a sound mm. people I'm going to remember this story of a, a, a veteran of war. He came back from a tour. I think it was Iraq or something. And, and he lived uh, in, in, a, in his home, which was next to a highway. And every time the motorcycles, you know, like the, the thumping of the engine, yes. he would be back on the battlefield. His oh. wife had the mayor of the town, you know, take the highway further apart from the building because they, they couldn't set up the, wow. the obvious. Yeah. Yeah. And really, yeah. I mean, it takes one thing. It could be sound. It could be a smell. It takes only one aspect of the original situation that was traumatizing to your body to kick mm -hmm. you back into fight and flight mode. And, right. But because your body literally, I mean, that's where our primordial parts of the brain, the more ancient ones, which we had been having since we were hominines, bipedal right. in the savannas, you know, hunting <laughs> saber tooth tigers. That's, that's right. how old this part of the brain is. Yes. So it's it's a very yeah. well working part and it's very reliable. It secured our survival. That's why it's so hard to convince it now that it's, yes. uh, everything's fine. You know, it, 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 it's constantly monitoring. That's where hypervigilance comes from. Uh, basically means, you know, we're always, that's why there's so much stress for people living mm -hmm. with PTSD, because you're always monitoring where can I, where's an exit route? Can right. I get out safely? I have to be quick because you're always under the stress. And again, this veteran, I had a, uh, um, I lived with, with a gentleman, a, a medical doctor at the time as a, as a tenant. 
and he had his friend who helped him, you know, with, with some house uh, maintenance things. And he came, he was actually in Afghanistan and they were ambushed by, by um, uh, Taliban fighters from three mm -hmm. angles and they didn't reckon, uh, you know, they hadn't prepared for the situation and nobody was there to get him off, you know, so mm -hmm. they had to hide under the vehicle. And it, Every time now he hears the screeching sound of brakes from a vehicle, he goes into fight flight and in a shock freeze eventually. And, and that is how quickly your body was reacts. And that's why it becomes really a lot of work. I mean, sorry, that's a, you know, that's bad news mm -hmm. about it. But the good news is yeah. there is neuroplasticity. You can absolutely do it. Yes. Yeah. And there's other like technologies like that are coming out. Um, I noticed that I've had success with um, EMDR, which is um, moving mm -hmm. your eyes from side to side. Yeah. Well, yeah. Or, or and, tapping um, can help. Yes, yeah. tapping some some people that that works really well. Um, mm -hmm. So there are definite like ways around it for sure. Um, what would you like to share um, in regards to um, everyone out there, the audience, um, about your trauma, about your survival and your life and maybe helpful resources. Okay. Um, first to start with a joke. <laughs> next time, you, next time you, you, uh, say something like that's a no brainer. You might be actually insulting someone with no brain. <laughs> back to this you shared earlier. Right. But right. Again, right. Really trying to, to be a little bit more, you know, see it as a journey like it's an exploration you're on an adventure you're you're your own make yourself your own this sounds a little bit negative but make yourself your own lab right which you have full command over you know like yeah try you're this, the experiment try this. right you're you're the experimenter you're, yeah. you're the scientist and the scientific yeah. object in the same you know and you yeah. have full control you are fully in command over what's happening so make it like an adventure see it as that be lighthearted about it. Laugh about yourself. Start, you know, having some, bring some humor into the fold. You know, this is something that therapy doesn't reflect much at this point, but I think it could help. You know, like some things are utterly in, insanely funny sometimes, you know, if you think about how even the, 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 the quick response, I mean, like, wow, you know, this is like, you know, I can rely on that. You can, you can frame it any way you want. It's not always negative. It's yeah, it's stressful. It's, it's a lot of work. It's probably going to last for a while and there are limitations, but it can be done. For me, the thing that got me out of this rut of this negative um, spiral was once I learned about neuroplasticity and this goes on even until death, you know, like we have this phenomenon called terminal lucidity when, when people with dementia and Alzheimer's at the very last moments before they pass on, they are totally lucid. They remember who the people in the room are coming to say farewell and they remember their lives they might remember music music is another thing i can't stress enough sound dr stephen porges um polyvagal theory it says some people say it has been debunked but he developed a safe and sound protocol for children diagnosed with hdh what's it called H adhd mm -hmm. thank you <laughs> um and it works. Sound works. And also binaural beats. There are like frequencies that are slightly different, yes. but the brain needs uh, to, to get them in sync. And this is also like a um, bilateral stimulation, excuse me, mm -hmm. of the brain. So any there are these physical correlations. I keep coming back to those mm -hmm. that do have an effect. And the effect is that there's a new experiencing uh, experience overriding the negative experiences. Yes. Yes. And that is where, that is your bread and butter in trauma recovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything that activates the parasympathetic system, mm -hmm. anything that works with binaural stimulation, whether it be EMDR or binaural beats or yes. uh, tapping, tapping is also, you can, you know, have these, um, what's it, what they call that for, for acu acupressure points on the yes. body, which respond. meridians, so meridian points, meridians, yeah. right. Meridian uh -huh. points. So the interesting bit for me now at, at this part of my own discovery and journey and learning is that there are these physical correlations. I think I mentioned to you in, in a different conversation we had earlier about this one a clinical um, psychological, what what's it called? Um, psychologist lady, I forget. I would have to look up where, uh, where I found it. It's also in, in my blog somewhere. She found that the frequencies of the... Um, Help me out here. We, we talked about it. What's it? Like um, Hertz? 
the Schumann, the Schumann resonance. Schumann resonance, um, yeah. The standing wave around the globe. She found yes. out that there's a correlation which can lead to people undergoing what's called a unity or uh, like um, you're in, tied into everything, universal connection with Mother Earth and everything. This kind of mis you know, mystic uh, revelation thing. There is a physical correlation and they were able to measure it. And it, it's a study. It's totally scientific. So this is no longer anything along the lines of woo-woo stuff. Yes, esoteric. exactly. There's more and more facts coming to the surface that corroborate why these things do actually work. Because they mm -hmm. all respond. I keep, you have this wonderful instruments behind you. The heart. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. and I keep thinking of our bodies more like an instrument now that mm -hmm. responds to positive stimuli just as much as it does to any negative stimuli, like an instrument. Yeah. All of us are an instrument in the ongoing, infinite, universal, cosmic symphony of yes. spirit. Exactly. Absolutely. And, you know, they, um, there's this whole, like, I don't know if I've told you this, that there's this whole um, certification you can get with the harp. You hook it up to a, a, a vibrating bed or pad that the person lays on and it's called vibroacoustic harp therapy and when you play like the lower notes you feel it in the lower part of the body when you play the higher notes the tinier strings um you'll feel it in the upper parts of the body and so people who have like frozen shoulder or maybe um like a frozen face or can't you know they've they've described going through this therapy and it breaks up it kind of like the vibration moves through that denseness and is able to either bring up emotions or memories or you know um break apart those physical symptoms and that is just purely a scientific thing when now that we're measuring how like vibration can change you know um physical symptoms so it's a beautiful thing and and being able to witness all of this happening right now um and coming to light um and then to be able to practice it and one thing I did want to talk about with you is that we had both of us talked about our brief su successes with um certain substances <laughs> and um and I was able to get three months of, um, depression relief, um, with using that substance, even though the substance experience at the time wasn't all that pleasant <laughs> with mm. the feeling of nausea and, and having to run to the bathroom mm. and, mm. and that sort of thing. But we both have, um, we, we have witnessed improvement. Yeah, absolutely. I take you up on that. Um, before we go there, let me just briefly recap. Uh, even uh, once more, sound. Even there, coming back to Dr. St uh, Stuart Hemeroff and and Serge or Penrose, because uh, Hemeroff and Penrose actually linked up, or Hemeroff approached him when he read his book, uh, The Emperor's New Mind, where mm. uh, Serge or Penrose was, was was thinking about consciousness, what makes it work in our and 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 Hemeroff being uh, an um, Anesthesia, uh, what's the word? Anesthesiologist by training. Mm -hmm. He put people under. He has mm -hmm. been doing that as a career, and he's now, I think, retired. He was with the uh, University of Arizona. He's now also a consciousness researcher. He has been at, at it for some time. And again, coming back to sound, that's why I bring it up once more. Um, he contacted Penrose and said, "Well, and they were thinking about quantum states in in the brain taking place in the brain. And so far, the understanding was too." too noisy, too wet, doesn't happen in the brain, not possible, because you mm -hmm. have certain certain conditions have to be meet for quantum uh, entanglement to happen. And that's where all the magic stuff starts, you know, with like superposition, and then a particle oh. shows up and particles get entangled. And, you know, they, they communicate with each other over distances without faster than the speed of light, which right. is physically impossible. So something what's going on there? Okay. <laughs> These are just brief, briefly touching on, on a yeah. vast amount of information which you can find on the internet, which is like smarter people than I have devoted their retirement or their entire lives to, you know. Yeah. So, anyways, but but again, saying that this is now, you know, the connection between what's what was used to be regarded as esoteric or spiritual woo-woo kind of stuff and hard science from what we measured and documented over and over, the connections are starting to become stronger. And yeah. more plausible. And here again, that's why I bring it up. Even with uh, what 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 Hammeroff to 
to briefly recap it, suggested recap it to, uh, suggested to Penrose was maybe the physical uh, infrastructure in the brain that could bring about quantum entanglement where it happens are what he calls uh, microtubuli in the brain. They are like small tubes that respond to certain frequencies hmm. in a structured, organized manner and then make for this sort of canvas where, inf where information manifests physically in the brain and, and becomes apparently a thought. That was, you know, just to really put it in a really tiny nutshell, like a vast amount of information on a very tiny nutshell. That's basically how I understood Oak. Um, orchestrated objective reduction and how it takes how quantum states take place in the brain. Mm -hmm. But again, sound is the facilitator or frequency, if you want to, yes. and, and sound, you know, in a medium, a frequency in a medium, because that's what sound is. If you pluck the harp, the air around it gets, uh, what's the word? Um, resonance. Resonant. It gets like uh, the, the molecules, the particles move because mm -hmm. of, you know, the air moves. And mm -hmm. that's what we pick up as through our auditory apparatus. That's what we hear. Mm -hmm. It takes a medium. You don't have sound in the um, in the vacuum. You don't, you know, it takes a medium. Right. It takes something else. But again, frequency, what's the word I'm looking for? In, um, inside, sound is the word inside or like um, instigates some, some other response or um, sparks another response. Mm -hmm. What's the word? Yeah. So again, frequency and sound is another word for, for frequency that helps to align those uh, microtubules in the brain so that they become this orchestrated canvas where quantum states might happen. That was the, the idea that Hammer uh, presented to Sir Roger Penrose. I hope I'm not misquoting him here. Probably he's going <laughs> to drop an email. It's totally <laughs> crap. What are you talking about? You haven't understood the, the first thing. Okay, if I have, then apologies. But I think that's I came back at it, and, and I think I'm not totally mis misrepresenting him here. But the point being that that um, something in our bodies is there that responds, and that brings me back to your uh, question or or uh, uh, experience with the substances. These are like, let's say your um, uh, your quick your quick route or your um, what could you call it like um it's it's an instant instantaneous way of getting your brain into a different mode of operation quickly mm -hmm. and if it weren't meant to be then it wouldn't work right right and again i have to quote indigenous people they have been using these substances for healing for ages they know right. about the positive effects also the side effects are quite you know taxing <laughs> but i mean there's always a price to pay while we're in the physical. Right. There's nothing is for free. There's right. no free <laughs> with anything. Right. So so um yeah, they have some side effects. I was part uh participate, I had participated in a clinical trial. That was also because the depression had you know, gotten the best of me to the point where life felt like any kind of life was taken out of me. I couldn't play my instruments any longer. I couldn't feel anything. Yes. And people with depression know that. Yes. The thing that makes it so intolerable for them is they can't feel anything but the depression any longer. Right. And it's like this thick cloth, this thick layer that that basically kills off any other emotion they ever had or could have. And that's the part that is not living. That is the, right. the opposite of living. So I understand that people become desperate. And and uh, again, here, this clinical trial that I eventually participated in, um, I was administered two very small doses, uh, doses, uh, dosages or doses, two small, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, of um, LSD, which is um, which was invented uh, by Dr. Albert Hoffman, accidentally, by the way. And in the States, you had uh, Alexander Shulkin or both uh, and his wife who uh, basically ran their own um, lab in their on their property, which is then exempt from Schedule 1 the pro prohibition and all that. So so they happened and they were actually <laughs> actively consulted by the FDA in terms of these substances for healing purposes. And there's oh, wow. also, and this is very important, especially for trauma survivors, there's uh -huh. now in the last phase of before it becomes um, actually approved by the FDA in your country, 
an organization by Rick Strassman, uh, Rick Dublin called um, maps.org. And okay. they have a protocol that's called um, MDMA assisted therapy, specifically working very well for trauma, people suffering from trauma and all the other outcomes because depression, dissociation, all these other, I mean, mm -hmm. at least you know, a, a number of, of, of yeah. diagnoses are like associated so-called comorbidities of trauma outcomes exactly. and are, uh, intimately linked into those as a secondary outcome because you're dealing with so much stress in your body, which your body can't hold. And okay. Right. So maps.org have, um, and they are in the last phase, it should have already been approved, but then COVID hit, they couldn't continue oh. as they had. And, uh, but it's supposed to become a really a prescribable standard, legitimate procedure. If you find a um, physician and, and, and a therapist uh, trained in their protocol, if you find one, if you can, if, probably also on Medicaid and Medicare, um, it, it takes it takes three, maybe four sessions split apart by a month. And the, and the booster session is like years after. And the relapse uh, ratio is like under 35% as mm -hmm. opposed to any other modality. So they are wow. really successful and they've been at it for 20, 25, 30 years wow. undergoing these clinical trials. I always wanted to get into one of those trials. And if anybody hears me out <laughs> here in this interview later on, I'm still, I'm still game. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you still have a slot. Exactly. I'll be, I'll be so there any, any second. Anyways, um, this is, I mean, look it up. It's, it's on maps.org slash MDMA or research actually slash research. And that's where they explain it and lay it down. It's been so successful. Um, there's another person that would have, whom I would have to mention, Amber Lyons. She was also, she was a journalist, investigator. Uh, she was in Iraq for CNN. And then she did some, you know, uh, uh, was investigating uh, child traffic and all these dark things. And and she totally transformed the tr uh, career and uh, f to to study now all these natural substances because they all have a correlate in, in, in nature, like uh, psilocybin and, and also LSD. It's from, what's what's the plant called? Motherkorn is, is there a word? I would have to look it up in English. In, in German, it's motherkorn. It's, it, mm. it was derived and synthesized from a, from a natural substance, which is interesting and ties back into what I said earlier. If it weren't supposed to work in our, uh, on our bodies, right. it's, it, it wouldn't. Right. Right. But and I do. liked your and statement have... of how you said, like, the earth has given us medicine Everything. yeah, and how yeah. to heal even this complex, um, you know, mental health um, issues, you know, from trauma. It's like the earth even gave us that. So it's 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 beautiful. And then both of us, you and I described how we felt afterwards. It was like you were part of the oneness of everything and everything yeah. was fine. Okay. Um, you were, you feel like you, you are, you are at peace with where you are with the situation with it's just, it, Oops. it really is a blissful feeling, isn't it? It was, it was the absolute opposite of this. I'm sorry. I have to fix it. I'm kind of a, that's my OCD kicking in. Hang on. <laughs> sure. I can get a little bit of a stickler. <laughs> so this was because I have to look at it all the time. I'd You're right, right. It, it has was, to be balanced. <laughs> okay. yeah. I mean, here's to learning. So maybe let's just leave it like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was the absolute opposite of my dark NDE. And that was my biggest concern. If I go back in with that, would I have to re-experience? Oh, that? that's, that's right. The... You were really worried about that um, yeah. taking the substance and having the same type of experience, but uh, you were with the doctor. And so the doctor helped you felt, feel more comfortable because you could be there with him and be monitored, yeah. right? And that is also important with the MDA, uh, MDMA assisted therapy. These um, substances alone, if you, if, you know, if that doesn't do anything. You have to be accompanied. You have to have a set and setting have to be good. You have to have uh, people you can rely on that make you yes. feel safe. So that is the setting. And, the and for my audience, 
for my audience, I also did that as well. I didn't just take this alone or anything like that. It was yeah, in a very yeah. monitored, monitored situation. Same yeah. thing. We're talking about really serious stuff here. This is not mm -hmm. nothing like a party trip tripping or anything. It's right. nothing. It's they got nothing to do with it. It's it's the absolute. Uh, this is medical um, research happening, yes. which you volunteer for. It's a serious situation. You have to have trained people accompanying you because a lot of material can come up with you want someone there who can deal with it and help you process it because that's mm -hmm. very likely to happen under these substances that old unprocessed things are going to be re-experienced and then and then what and then the important thing is that now you have a chance of having a new experience as a response which you didn't mm -hmm. have at the time that the trauma happened that's the that's the main aspect i think that's again putting it in a nutshell and yes. that is where these substances can really help to break apart these um learned um mechanisms of denial and you know just pushing it under the rug and all these things that keep you in this normal functioning mode at a price because it has a price all the time you know at mm -hmm. an expense so these substances i said it's like like a a quick a, a fast charged way of getting there quick mm -hmm. but still with assistance that's in i mean indispensable you you, you can't just you know uh, drop a mushroom or anything in and, and, and hope for the same results that's not right. gonna happen you want to have people around you and that is what this doctor did for me he really convinced me that if anything stressful happens i'm going to be there we can like um phase it out quickly if it becomes too stressful i had other medication that opposes and works as an antagonist to this and and, and so i was trusting and i could fully um uh, uh you know, tr um, with a lot of confidence and, and trust in him and in the in the workings of the medication, I was committing to this experience and opening up to the experience. That's also why it was so overwhelmingly positive. And I would have to say, that's probably what what I said earlier at, at the outset of this interview uh, or this conversation. Um, as a, as a baby, all you have to do is you know hang hang on to your mother's breast and, right. and, and that's all there is and that's right. you, you had nine months of you know free lunch food supply <laughs> ongoing food supply in the womb and everything was fair and fine ideally not with every pregnancy but right. usually, you know and and then to continue on and that, that's the first thing you're supposed and then everything is blissful and everything is fine and and so that was the nature of this experience yeah mm, yeah and it gave yeah. me it gave me relief from from the symptoms for quite some time if yeah. Things had become like in life, if if life had um, continued to improve in other areas as well, I uh -huh. think the effect would have been a more lasting. Even life. longer. Even yeah. Longer. yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. Um, I know I, I'm definitely would like to find, uh, you know, um, a, a doctor that I could do some like microdosing or something like that yeah. as a way to see. In the states, you are so lucky. You have these all these things that you know these these um, uh, um, procedures that uh, facil you know enable you to to actually find some. It's called compassionate use. You know, even if it's not fully legitimate at the moment, if you're like at the end of your tether before actually doing something harmful that you can't reverse to yourself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you are totally. Uh, it's totally legitimate to find a trained physician or uh, a psychiatrist or uh, therapist experienced with administering those substances, mm -hmm. experienced in what the effects can be, experienced in handling those outcomes, you know, and you can do it formally. You have to have the approval, of course, and there has to be some red tape and, and yada, yada. Mm -hmm. But at least the possibility is there, you know, even now, even right. before it gets approved. I don't want to invite anybody to go out there and, you know, like scout out, you know, yeah, we'll go tripping. That's not the point. <laughs> right. You still have to be very uh, reasonable and responsible. And and your physician, your your uh, therapist has to be too. But at least you have these modalities in the United States. You're way ahead in that regard, as opposed to my country. Oh, that's so great. And I didn't even know about that until you mentioned it. So thank you so much. What 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 else would you like the audience to know um, and share before we wrap things up? Wrap up, yeah. 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 Well, if you're um, coming away from a history of trauma and there can be really grueling things in the world, let's let's not kid about that. I mean, but it's no one is exempt from it. 
some people have it easier or maybe not maybe it looks easier on the outs on the outside and it isn't so this life here on earth really is a piece of work let's put it that way um and if you're especially if you're coming away from trauma especially if it's so early like like in my and many other cases um there's a there's a lot of work additional work that you have to that you have signed up for but it can absolutely be done mm -hmm. life you're not you're not subjected or uh, uh there's no verdict like you you had a bad deck of cards and it's going to stay for that and you just right. have to write it out until it, that's not the case at all right and that's what makes this so fascinating we still have authority so there is something to free will and and, and uh, autonomy, you know, yes. like, like every soul for themselves. There is something to it. And this is proof, you know, part and parcel of the proof. You can do so even with negativity bias and even with bad outcomes, you still can improve your lives to to being so much better than they have started out. And that, mm -hmm. that was, would be the thing that I would like to encourage people to remind themselves of, especially when... and. Uh, talking to myself here as well. I have to remind, myself, you know, includes me as well. I'm not lecturing. I'm, I'm, I'm still working. And, and there are days that it feels like, uh, you know, it's not worth it. But then I, you. I yourself, have those days too. <laughs> yeah. And, and then I try to think of the days when I did feel better, like after, after that, you know, uh, therapy sessions and yeah, uh, or with MDMA. And I think. Also, the positive, the bright outlook is that now more and more legitimate, uh, sincere scientists are catching up and opening up to this new information that's coming in from all sides all at once, you know, mm -hmm. from every angle all at once. Spiritualist, spiritual or not, you know, religious or not, trained medical or not, you know, there are all these people coming to the fore, especially with this medium. I mean, look at that. Yeah. I was dreaming of something like that when I was 14. And now I, I know video conferencing. The, the person I mentioned earlier with the military, they they only the highest command, you know, uh, uh, what's it called? The, the highest um, echelons of command had had video conference oh, right. in situations of war. Now everybody has that yeah. on their on their freaking phone. Which yeah. carry, you know, yeah. this is amazing. So yeah. information is on a fast track to being disseminated. Good information, helpful yes. information, beneficial information that can help people lead personal personally better lives and eventually collectively beautiful i just like i said you are you are a complete wealth of uh wisdom and information and knowledge and i have learned so much through your own experiences your your trauma you know traumatic uh start and um your current life challenges and all of that and it's just like you what you have created for yourself and what you have done to to further your knowledge and to improve your situation and yourself you really are just you just never gave up and you're so strong and um and not only that your ability to recall names and like <laughs> websites and books and information i am just like absolutely in awe of because i feel like i i do not have that <laughs> It's like my brain's like, I must clear the surface to be able to, you know, handle daily tasks. And so I feel like I always forget names and all that kind of stuff. So you again, you just are walking around with so much wisdom and life experience and um, trauma but recovery. I, but again, thank you to you for giving me the opportunity of sharing and you yeah. bring something else. I mean, everybody, and that's the beauty of diversity of humans, you know, everybody brings something specific into the fold of this current experience on earth everybody yeah. has something you play the harp you have your own history you have your own knowledge and wisdom to share you yeah. bring people together i hear that you're thinking about a group and a, and a thing yeah everybody brings something into the fold that makes it ultimately better than it has to be or used to be and i think transformation to use this big word is palpable at the yeah. moment it's, yeah. it's happening it's happening everybody can contribute to something everybody has something that they contribute mm -hmm. that nobody else has and every one of us and again i would have to give it back to you and everybody else listening each and every one of us are heroes and heroines in the making or probably not just in the making proven heroes and we are if we if you survive these difficult outcomes 
you absolutely <laughs> earned your your uh, your hero uh, medal or whatever it's called. Yeah, uh, whatever you, you, call you it. earned your but wings. <laughs> you earned your wings. But everybody yeah. everybody does the same thing. We're all in that regard. We're all tasked with a very similar thing, and everybody approaches it differently. And now we can bring all the information together. Yes. And yeah. fast charge transformation in ways which the planet the species has never seen before now mm. it's possible exactly exactly and that's exactly why i wanted to capture your story and so thank you so much for sharing and uh, being with us today and um yeah uh we look forward to um hopefully some future groups and and having you contribute um continue Absolutely. to contribute i'm so. all game okay all right thanks a lot wes all right i'll talk to you later Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Talk to you later. Thanks. Bye.